It's always rose-colored glasses in the beginning. Lee and Brock Orwig know that now. So tell me about how you met. I was at the University of Michigan, and I thought she was terrific. Uh, smart and pretty, and I mean, I just thought she was just awesome. And Lee must have thought something similar, though she's less open to talking about it now. He says that when he saw you, he just thought you were the most beautiful thing ever. That's nice. <laughs> I just, I, when I first saw him, I, I just, there was a part of me that just said, you know, I knew we would be together. The two went on to date nearly 10 years before finally tying the knot. Boy, have things changed since then. At what point do you believe that the marriage started to unravel? Probably right before we had our daughter. It was roughly four years after they got married. My daughter or our daughter was born with some special needs. She had some significant neurological uh, issues. Issues Lee says she mostly had to deal with on her own due to Brock's work schedule. He was gone 99% of the time and that was very difficult. But Brock says that's not why their marriage fell apart. I realized that Lee's drinking was impacting um, her ability to care for our daughter. An accusation Lee vehemently denies. Either way. Who initiated the divorce? Brock did. Were you surprised? Yeah, I was playing soccer and I was approached by a stranger on the soccer field that served me with divorce papers in front of the entire team. And if you thought things sounded ugly before. Since the day the divorce started, it's just been the never ending war. To be more specific, Lee says that in the years after their divorce, Brock has waged a nasty smear campaign, painting her as an alcoholic who can't take care of their child. But then, Brock says Lee's the one who went on the warpath. Lee made all sorts of allegations about me, that I had beat her. I heard allegations that I had been beating our daughter. And obviously, you know, none of those were true. True or not, over the course of at least seven years, Lee and Brock Orwig would find themselves facing off in family court more than once. That's a long time to be butting heads with someone. It is. Brock tells us Lee was eventually awarded sole custody of their daughter while he was ordered to pay child support plus alimony. Lee tells us Brock filed for bankruptcy and that she's seen little of that money. And that's basically where things stood between the Orwigs in the weeks before the morning of November 6th. We'll call it the event. So leading up to the event of November 6th, um, Lee and I had very little contact. It was infrequent at best. On that, Lee and Brock agree. Everything after? Brock refers to that day as the day of the event. How convenient for him. First, what Lee says happened. I had gotten her out to the bus, got her on the bus. I went back inside and started typing an email on my computer. I was not even halfway through the email when I felt something hit my head. Lee says that in the split second that followed, she was stunned. And that was when I got up and I turned around and I looked behind me and here's this guy wearing a dark knit cap with a blonde wig, dark clothing with his arm raised up and he was about to strike my head again. A complete stranger, as far as she knew. I don't know if he had a nylon covering his face or not. I just remember seeing a big smile on the face and his nose looked flat. I had no idea who this was. And she says there was no time to figure it out. That the man hit her head at least 15 more times with what was later found to be a two by four in a tube saw. He dropped the weapon at one point in time, but then he started to go for my throat. And it got to the point where I knew that I just couldn't fight him off anymore. In that instant, Lee says she decided the only way to stay alive was to play dead. I'd have to hold my breath. And she says it seemed to work. According to Lee, the assailant loosened his grip and left her on the floor before eventually coming back to tie up her arms and legs with rope. Lee says next, the man stuffed 
pills in her mouth, then wrapped her head with a towel and poured what she believes was alcohol down her throat. It kind of tasted like vodka. But that's where I had to stop her. Why would her attacker go to all that effort if he thought she was already dead? What do you believe was the purpose of putting pills and maybe vodka in your mouth down your throat? That was his third way of trying to kill me if I wasn't already dead. She says, thankfully, she was able to spit out the pills when the man wasn't looking, but that he still wasn't done. I could hear him in my knife drawer, and then I thought, oh my god, I'm totally dead. This, th this is it. He's going to stab me to death. But as she braced for that end, she says the man suddenly untied her arms, grabbed her left hand, and put the tips of her fingers on the knife handle. Then he did the same thing with my right hand. At that point in time, he put a blindfold over me. I could hear him grab my keys, and finally, he exited. That's when Lee says, with her legs still tied, she jumped up, locked the door, and stumbled to her phone. I need someone over here right now. I've just been attacked and tried to, to kill me. Okay, who tried to kill you? I don't know, some guy. I didn't know where he was. I could see that the small door to the garage was open a little bit, and that's when I told the police. I'm trying to keep the door locked. He's in my garage right now. Okay. But you don't I'm know. I'm very scared. Then Lee says, as she talked to the dispatcher, I heard the screen door to the side door open. And, and somebody it? just tried to come back in my side door. Please send someone right now. Off. Police arrive shortly after that and find a badly beaten Lee Orwig covered in blood. And that wasn't all. In the detached garage, detectives find something she definitely did not mention on that call. Her ex-husband, Brock Orwig, face down on the concrete, a butcher knife sticking out of his back. I said, huh? Brock tells an entirely different story. I know. Lee Orwig called police to say she was attacked by an unknown intruder wearing a wig. What she didn't say was that when police arrived, they would find Lee's ex-husband, Brock Orwig, flat on his face with a butcher knife in his back. What is the first you say that you learned it was Brock? I was in the emergency room. But how could that be after an assault Lee says lasted for roughly two hours? How could you not have recognized your husband? Ex-husband. Ex-husband. How could you not have recognized your ex-husband in such a poor disguise? I have no idea. I, I just, I think that there was poor lighting in my house. He was wearing a disguise. Very difficult to see through the blood. It was, I mean, it was all down my face. And it is true that Lee did suffer some severe injuries. I had 23 staples put into three large lacerations in my head. But she insists she had no idea it was Brock delivering those blows. She also strongly denies being the person who stabbed him. At least, that's what she says today. Take a listen to this statement from one of the EMTs who treated Lee that day. She just stated that uh, she didn't know what else to do, so she picked up a knife from the kitchen and had stabbed her boyfriend. Not much ambiguity there. So an ambulance driver, an EMT, said that they heard you say that you had stabbed your boyfriend in the back. I have no idea about that conversation, but I never would have said that, and I never said it. She identified him as her boyfriend throughout your conversation with him? That's what she said, yes. So you never said that you stabbed your boyfriend in the back? Why would I call Brock my boyfriend, first of all? But no, I never said that. And Lee says it doesn't matter anyway in light of this email from one of the detectives working the case. It reads in part, the paramedic called and said she had injected some assumptions into her statement. These people redacted a lot of their statements because I never said those things. A 
Okay, so then who did bury that knife in Brock's back? Well, how bad was the injury? Well, they said that she had put the knife in four and a half or five and a half inches. Apparently had just missed my aorta or whatever, and it was, anyway, it was horrible. In his first ever national TV interview, Brock Orwig sits down to give us his version of what he's calling the event. Okay, when's the last time you saw her before the event, which I will call the attack. I mean, you had a knife in your back and she had been bonked in the head, right, so, right. yeah. So on uh, November 5th, uh, I was volunteering as a, a lunchroom monitor and Lee came in. What did you talk about? It was about parenting time and money. And I said, listen, you know, I'm hoping we can get some of this stuff behind us. I said, you know, can we talk about it sometime? And she said, yes, you know, come on over tomorrow and we'll talk about it. And I said, okay. Even though both of them claim they hadn't been on speaking terms for months. Was there a set time that you were supposed to go to Lee's house? Uh, well, she, we just decided to come over after our daughter went to school. Brock says he walked there from a friend's house that morning and that all seemed fine. I went to the, uh, her side door. It was open and I knocked on the door and then uh, I saw her come to the door. She invited me in. Once inside, Brock says Lee had him take off his shoes, and as he bent over to do that... I looked up just as she was swinging something at my head. That something, he claims, was the same weapon Lee says was used on her. I ended up ducking. Obviously, I didn't get hit. Instinctively, I ended up kicking her back. She fell down on the ground, and I came over to her and ended up wrestling a two-by-four cut out of her hands. And what is being said while this is going on? Oh, she's screaming, you're a dead man. You owe me so much money. It was on and on. She was irate. Mad enough, he says, to kill. I stepped back. She hopped up. I saw her grab something off the counter or near her stove. I thought it was a spatula at first. I realized very <laughs> soon after that it wasn't. And she had a butcher knife in her hand. Brock says after that, he started backing away from the kitchen and into her living room. It was clear that she wasn't gonna stop. And I had to defend myself. And this is the part that haunts me. And I feel horrible about it. With the two by four he wrestled out of Lee's hand, Brock says he had no choice but to swing. It just made her matter. So I hit her again, and then finally I hit her a third time. Then she was stunned. Brock says that's when he knocked the knife out of her hand and spotted Lee's car keys on the floor, his chance to get away. So I figured I would grab her car and go for help. So I ran into the garage. I couldn't figure out how to start the car. So I got out of the car, went back to the service door that I came in, and as soon as I opened it, Lee was there with the butcher knife. She slashed at me, I had nothing to defend myself, and I turned to run. I felt this indescribable pain in my back. My whole body was contracting. I couldn't breathe. All I remember is falling to my knees and then everything went black. I woke up in the hospital sometime later that day. Detectives were there waiting to take a statement. So tell me again, how long were you in the house actually? I think it was like 45 seconds. Oh, so you were just in the house briefly. A far cry from the two hours Lee says the attack lasted, but just like with Lee's account. I have a few questions. Of course. When she came at you, right. why didn't you just turn around and run? Uh, uh, I was inside. But the kitchen is here, the door is here, and you're here. And if she's by the kitchen, that means the door is closer to you. No, it doesn't. Do you want me to draw a picture of what, what it looked like? Well, if he was offering. The door here is going to be just like the door you walked in, and then you're going to walk us through what happened. Okay, so you walk in. She swung this thing at me. I ducked. I ended up kicking her back. She fell into her oven or stove. All right, so let me stop you right there. If I'm in approximately the same area which you were in, 
and she falls, you at this moment had every opportunity to leave, to get out and run away. Nothing was blocking you. Why didn't you run? I was in shock. I didn't know what to do. It didn't even occur to me. Not the most satisfying answer. And just what does Lee think? He says you invited him to the house and you came at him with a knife. That's very inventive. Now, why do you <laughs> say that that's inventive? Because that's not the truth. Brock Orwig says he never wanted to hurt his ex-wife, but that he had no choice. I just, you know, I feel horrible about it. She was my best friend. She was my bride. We were supposed to grow old together. I feel terrible that I hurt her. I feel awful. Whether or not you believe that, there are two things we know for sure. Lee Orwig was hit over the head with a two by four wrapped in a tube sock. And Brock Orwig was stabbed in the back with a six inch butcher knife. Without question, those two things happened. Yep. The question is, who put the knife in Brock's back? I think it would be great if, if the Edina police could talk to you guys. And we've been trying. Unfortunately, police in Edina, Minnesota have declined to be interviewed at this time. But in the aftermath of the Orwig attacks, they did release their own video, which explains their investigation. We had over 300 pieces of evidence in this case, which is extraordinary. Now they just had to match the right evidence to the correct story. If you listen to Brock Orwig's story, he shows up, he's attacked literally at the doorway or just inside the door of the home by a crazy woman with a knife. She's flailing knives, slicing into his skin. And detectives find what look like defensive wounds on his arms. The crime scene investigators were suspicious. Each one of those cut marks were um, superficial in nature, that's how I would classify them. And they were very linear to one another on his arm, whereas um, they could be potentially uh, self-induced. And then there was Brock's story of how he escaped to the garage. He chooses to run out of her home, and instead of going to the street where there's a bus stop and, and cars driving by constantly, he chooses to run into her fenced-in backyard and then into her closed garage. Of course, Lee tells a very different story. And police do find multiple pieces of evidence to support that account, including the ropes and blindfold Lee says Brock used to subdue her, the booze and pills he allegedly stuffed down her throat, and even the wig and hat she says Brock wore. But when they test DNA found on that wig and hat, none of Brock's DNA was found but your DNA was. Yep. How do you explain that? My DNA was found on the outside. Okay, say I'm wearing a wig. No, no, you weren't wearing the wig, I right? I wasn't wearing the wig. Okay. Say I'm wearing a wig and I'm hitting somebody like this. Mm -hmm. You get blood spatter coming up every time you hit. So of course my DNA is gonna be on the wig. It's my blood spatter. And court documents show that synthetic hair fibers determined to have come from the wig were found on Brock's jacket. Then again, it's what police didn't find on Brock's jacket that really gave detectives pause. He had slices on his arm that he claimed were caused by her attacking him. There's no corresponding slices in the jacket sleeve. But he got stabbed in the back. There's no corresponding knife hole in the back of the jacket. But there was still something else about that jacket stuffed inside one of the pockets, a slip of paper. On one side, a hand-drawn map leading to Lee's house from where police would eventually find Brock's car parked just down the street from his friend's place eight miles away. And on the other side of that paper? A handwritten list of multiple items that basically I believe were likely used in the commission of this crime. Booze, knives, basically all the things Lee included in her story. It was literally what I would call a murder to-do list. Conclusion? The totality of everything we saw told us that um, the story of Lee Org was correct and the story of Brock was contrived and incorrect. Brock Orwig is arrested and charged with three counts, including first degree burglary, second degree assault, and first degree attempted murder. But if police didn't believe Brock, 
That means they still had to account for how that knife got into his back. Hold on, this may just be the craziest thing you've heard yet. There were some circular blood stains that were located along a wall, actually a, right next to a, um, a bobsled in the garage. The geometric shape of those blood stains uh, showed me that uh, they likely fell pretty much straight down. And putting everything together, I felt that that knife was the way it was in his back. I felt it was something where he may have also put that knife to his back and actually backed into that sled and those blood stains uh, fell to the ground. That's right. According to investigators, Brock Orwig wedged a giant butcher knife into a crease in that toboggan, then made a potentially suicidal move. Well, you don't really believe that Brock put this knife in his own back, do yeah, you? Yeah, I do. You believe that? Yeah, I do. Why would he put a knife in his own back? Because when he tried to come back into my house and realized that I wasn't dead, that must have been his plan B. But doesn't that sound crazy, Lee? The yeah, but Brock is crazy. Sorry, but he is. Brock Orwig lied when he said his wife invited him into her home, then stabbed him in the back. At least that's the conclusion police and prosecutors in Edina, Minnesota came to after examining over 300 pieces of evidence. I was charged with first degree premeditated attempted murder. And as for how Brock was stabbed. That is about the craziest theory I've heard. The police say that you took the knife and you stuck it in the wedge of the toboggan and that you basically stabbed yourself in the back. That was their theory. Did you? No. No. But that would be one man's word against the state of Minnesota. And if either side wanted to win their case, they would have to convince Bob. What was your role in all of this? I was the jury for person. It wasn't Bob's first time serving on a jury. But he says as soon as he heard the opening arguments, he knew he had his work cut out. I'm saying to myself, what's going on here? We're hoping that between the both sides would come back to us and, and give us the information that we can make an informed decision. If only it had been that easy. Though no cameras were in the courtroom, the prosecution quickly set about disproving Brock's story, starting with the day before the attack, when he says he ran into Lee at their daughter's school and she invited him over. Is that true? No, we weren't on speaking terms. I was surprised that he was there. You could have cut the air with a knife. The real story, prosecutors argued, is what Lee said in the beginning that he tried to strangle her because there was some problems with he was not paying child support. But did the evidence really support the charges? First, there was that two by four Brock says he wrestled out of Lee's hands, then used in self-defense. It had uh, both my DNA and hers. Okay, and that kind of supports your version of what happened? Well, I, yeah. But supporting Lee's story? When police searched Brock's house, they found wood matching the 2x4 used in the attack, the other tube sock matching the one on the 2x4, and even rope matching the ones Lee says Brock used to bind her. His defense? There were several occasions where there were some things that were stolen from my driveway. And I have no doubt it was Lee. I what was missing? Yeah, there we go. So, so what was missing was um, the two by four, uh, one of my socks, and there were pieces of rope that I had used on my friend's boat. An almost too perfect explanation. We kind of say to ourselves, okay. And that was still just a small sampling of the evidence. There was also Brock's jacket, which police said should have been cut up to match his knife wounds. But Brock says he was already half out of his jacket before the knife ever came out. Okay, so you had part of your jacket still on while this wrestling is going on. Yes, it fell off at some point while we were wrestling. 
But even if you believe that, what about the quote, murder to-do list detectives found in that jacket? What was your opinion of the to-kill list? <laughs> they had brought in a handwriting expert too. You know, who actually wrote this note and everything? And from what we were able to gather, Brock did not write the note. An unexpected twist. The prosecution's own expert couldn't conclusively say the handwriting was Brock's. And if he didn't write it... If she had forged my name before, yes, she had. She, as in Lee. So his defense asked, had she also forged the note? He says, you wrote them and put them in his pockets. I must have forgotten to leave my DNA on them. I didn't have anyone's DNA on it. It was so bizarre, you know, everything that was going back and forth. And it would only get crazier. On the other side of that note, the hand-drawn map leading from Lee's house to where police found Brock's car. Not at his house, but near a friend's place. I'll give you that the murder to-do list looks more like a plant. The map? I don't know where I fall on the map, because how could she have known your car would be parked pretty much in the same location as the map has it. Easy, Brock's lawyer argued. She was stalking him. I think she was obsessed. And believe it or not, the jury was listening. Was Lee stalking Brock, you know, watching every move of him. So you think that's a possibility? It's always a possibility. So you didn't immediately say, well, the only person who could have known this information was Brock, therefore Brock made that map. No, no. Reasonable doubt? So then he suggests maybe you were following him. Was I following him while I was chasing him with a knife? <laughs> I don't understand. And of all the evidence presented at trial, both sides argued it was that knife that said the most. Here's something I don't understand about the knife in your back. The blood on the handle of that knife belongs to you. How is that possible? I don't think that was my blood. I think that's hers. It's not her blood. It's yours. I don't know about that. Really? Yeah. Hold on. Yeah, please. Envelope containing swabbing of blood-like substance from the knife handle matches the DNA profile obtained from Brock and it does not match the DNA profile of Lee. Good, okay, so I guess that's pretty clear. So the only thing I could tell you is if that was my blood, then that would be the same blood that was on Lee's hands, that would be the same blood that was on the floor in the garage. The same blood he says she got on herself after slashing at his arms. Now keep in mind, I'm oozing blood all over the place. There is no blood trail from my side door to the garage because I wasn't following him. None of my blood is in the garage. It's all Brock's. But an even bigger question than how Brock's blood got on the handle was how the knife really got in his back. Was the prosecution's theory even possible? You'd have to be like in Cirque du Soleil to pull off something and, like that. You know, Brock was a gymnast. He's a, a lot more flexible than you think he necessarily is, but I have no idea what happened in my garage that day. I only know what happened to me that day. And again, there seemed to be plenty of evidence to support that. But the knife? It did not happen with that knife wedged in the back of that toboggan. Did not happen that way. What does that mean, Bob? When the marriage is over, who gets the knife? Attorneys prosecuting Brock Orwig for the attempted murder of his ex-wife agree it was him, but that he gave it to himself. Do you believe that? No. We actually had the weapon, and we tried to look, put it behind us and said, how can you stab yourself in the back? And if they didn't believe that, then how do you think the knife got in Brock's back? Lee stabbed him. It's what Brock had been saying all along, though it still didn't mean the rest of Lee's story was false. The evidence was all over the board. There was just a lot of misinformation that was being thrown our way. For instance, there was Brock's claim that he walked to Lee's from a friend's house roughly eight miles away, a claim police were never able to verify because Brock didn't have his cell phone with him. 
In fact, I, I had left my wallet and my cell phone on my bedside table that morning. I sometimes forgot them. Isn't that unusual not to have your cell phone on you? No, uh, I've, I've forgot my wallet and cell phone lots of times. Did you find that suspicious? Absolutely. On the other hand, is it really possible Lee didn't recognize her attacker during the two-hour assault? And is her whole story even logistically possible? Okay, so when she came back in that morning, Brock somehow snuck in the side door, hid behind the couch, but when you look at that couch, the way it was sitting in the living room, there's no way that Brock could have hidden behind that couch. It just did not happen that way. And after both sides made their closing arguments, even judges looking at the case were confused with one quoted as saying, at oral argument, neither party's attorney could offer any story logically consistent with the physical evidence. In other words, when we went into deliberation, we started picking it apart. There were so many lies that were going back and forth that we were trying to get to the bottom of it. You know, what really happened here? And after days of going over the evidence and nearly deadlocking, Bob and the rest of the jury came to this conclusion. I firmly believe, and, I, and most of the other jurors, that Lee was the one that instigated, you know, the, this whole event. On the charge of premeditated first-degree attempted murder, Brock Orwig is found not guilty. And the jury was unanimous on that Unanimous one. on that, right, right. Unanimous, he says, in believing it was the other way around, that all the evidence pointed back to Lee being the premeditated one. So you believe Brock was indeed invited to the house? Correct. The whole jury thought that he was attacked when he walked in, into the house. When she called 911, do you believe she thought she'd killed him? Yeah. Really? Yeah. And somebody just tried to come back into my side door. Please send someone right there, Bob. I think she was trying to cover her tracks. And Bob wasn't just telling me. I told the prosecutor after the case that I was surprised that she wasn't on trial for attempted murder. But if Lee did stab Brock, why wasn't any of her DNA found on the knife handle? Not even the fingerprints she claims her attacker planted while she played dead. Don't you find that kind of weird? We did find it weird, but we also felt that, that she could have put something over the handle on that particular knife. Of course, Lee is not and has never been charged with anything related to the attack, insisting she and the state of Minnesota had it right the first time. So Brock is claiming that I stabbed him in the back and the reason is because I wanted the $20,000 settlement money? He said that you were yelling at him about the money that he owed you and that's why you came at him with a knife. So how would stabbing him get me the money? I have no idea. Just curious. But you would be rid of him. Yeah, but that wouldn't give me the money that he, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Have you gotten the money anyway? No. No, so there you go. But even though the jury found Brock innocent of murder, he wasn't exactly off the hook. On the lesser charge of second degree assault, it was guilty. But if he did it in self-defense, then why did you convict him of assault? The jury felt that because of the severity of the head wounds that Lee sustained, we had to do something here. He could have backed off. Brock Orwig is sentenced to three years behind bars, ultimately serving two. You were convicted and sent to prison for attacking your ex-wife. I don't know that that's accurate. Um, I think what the jury found was that uh, I defended myself with too much force. It's assault. You were convicted of assault. It's either assault or it's not. And they said assault. I mean, that's not in dispute, right? No, absolutely not. The, the reality is I didn't have a choice. I mean, I ended up having to defend myself. Uh, she was coming at me with a butcher knife. Brock is now out on parole and says he's just trying to put the whole thing behind him. There's no question she set me up, but I've, I've moved on. I mean, I've forgiven her, and I don't want to be defined by that event as, the, the oh, you're the guy who got stabbed by his ex-wife and then got to go to prison. I, I don't want that to define me though he is currently prohibited from having any contact with Lee or their daughter. Lee says his freedom alone is a slap in the face. Brock got away with premeditated attempted murder. He should have been in prison for a lot longer for what he did. Two years wasn't enough? N no, no. I'm given a life sentence now. 
He's out of prison, and as soon as his GPS bracelet comes off, he can go anywhere he wants to. I have a 50-year OFP against him, order for protection, but that's a piece of paper. That doesn't guard my life, and I live in fear. Yet Brock says you're the one who got away with attempted murder. All I did that morning was survive. That's all I did. <laughs>